Hello, I'm Mel Ferguson, and I just want to start off by saying what an absolute pleasure it is to be giving this presentation at the Computational Audiology 2024 online conference, and to thank Simone for the very kind invite to talk today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the essential role of co-design and participatory approaches in digital hearing health. And by the end of the presentation, I hope you can see that um, involvement of end users in research is no longer a nice to have, but a must have. Um, I'd like also to acknowledge some of my key collaborators in one of the uh, projects that I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm based in um, Perth in Western Australia, and you can see Perth shown in the um, left hand uh, corner of the map there. Um, it's the capital city of Western Australia, and Western Australia, along with Australia, is, is pretty huge. So Western Australia is the size of Western Europe, um, although the population is only 3 million. So Western Australia is very empty. Um, but as you can see on some of the photographs that I've got um, taken from my time here, that it's a very, very beautiful part of the world. So I'm very lucky uh, to live and work here. Um, so moving on to my talk. Um, uh, what I want to be clear by the end of the day is that the end um, goal of um, in designing digital um, hearing health is to make research and developments relevant and usable for the end users. And the reason for this is that we have better outcomes when we involve end users. So um, the involvement of end users in research is not new. So there was a series of articles in 2014 published in The Lancet, which is really focusing on and research in terms of increasing value and reducing waste. So quite shockingly, this um, one of the articles reported that um, up to 85% of um, research funds have no direct uh, value on patient needs. And it was really clear that um, there's often a mismatch in terms of the re research agenda um, that's set by researchers and the needs of the patients. And some of this can be um, re re reduced by involving users in um, shaping research. And quite often when people think about involving end users in research, you think about co-production or co-design. So this is when researchers and clinicians and other um, stakeholders work together. And the key thing here is that the responsibility and the power in the research doesn't lie with the researchers, but relies with the whole of um, all, everybody who takes part. And the aim of this is to ensure that the needs of the end user are met. Um, another sort of less well-known um, involvement of end users in research is in the shaping of research questions. And the National Institute for Health Research in the UK have been at the forefront of this with the James Lind Alliance, which aims to raise awareness of what matters most to patients and clinicians. So making sure that their voice is well heard within research. Now, there are a number of different terms that can be used um, for, for end user involvement. In the UK, the NIHR talks about patient and public involvement. Um, or PPI. And in Australia and America and some other countries, this is known as consumer and community involvement or CCI. And that's the term I'm going to be using today. I've been working with CCI and engagement with other stakeholders for well over a decade now. And this involvement has been core to the development of all our digital tool um, research. So I started off in 2011, and you can see uh, in the photographs here, and I'm going to Finish off. I'm going to be talking mostly today about a project that um, we've been doing in the last year um, here in Australia. But one of the key um, tenets around um, involving um, other stakeholders is that these people are working with the researchers, not for the researchers. And it's very much around the agenda of no research about us without us. The first time I kind of got involved in this was in the development of some um, videos for first time hearing aid users, which are called See to Hear. And there are a number of different ways that um, um, end users were involved. So we had a um, CCI project specific panel with people in, involved in the project right the way through um, the research. And in terms of the development of See to Hear, we had storyboard workshops involving hearing aid users and audiologists. And then as we went through and developed a spec and reviewed the spec, then um, developed the videos and reviewed the videos, we had iterative input um, from both audiologists and hearing aid users throughout. And the reason being is we wanted to embed the end user's voice in the, um, in the research. So what did um, some of our CCI panel members say? 
Well, I've got some quotes here. Um, one of them said, all members of the team have an equal voice and opinions are heard, acknowledged, valued and respected during the discussions. Ideas are exchanged, discussed, explored and tested in a range of varied co contexts. Somebody else said, I've been involved right from the concept to the finished article and the great thing is I've been treated as an equal. And then finally, another quote is, my views and thoughts have been listened to and taken into account. I see and hear words and ideas incorporated into the project, which was which are mine. So hearing this from our panel members on a num this was across a number of projects um, around C to here is really really assuring that they really do feel valued. And as a researcher, I truly value what they have to say. Involving CCI also means that you're more likely to see um, research findings being translated into clinical practice, so able to look at uh, impact, which is more than research papers. And for me, um, I like to think that a lot of the research we do actually does get translated into, into the clinics. And so, for example, we can see with uh, see to here we've had well over a million views um, from across the world. But particularly um, at the time of the COVID pandemic in, in 2020, um, you can see there was a fourfold increase in the take up of um, C to here as people were going online to get the information they needed. Um, we've, in terms of impact, we've had views from over 50 countries. Um, C to here um, has been used in UK audiology departments and has been on um, around 50 um, websites um, from the departments. And um, they've been included in national clinical guideline documents in the UK. And have also, uh, C to here is also. Um, uh, won a number of research impact awards. So what I'm going to be talking about today is a project called Hair Choice. And the background to Hair Choice is really looking at accessibility and affordability of hearing care. So we know that prevalence of hearing loss is high, yet the uptake of hearing devices is low. And in Australia, around about 40% of those people who attend audio audiology clinics um, leave empty handed. So nothing is done around to address their hearing difficulties. We also know that there's an average delay um, of around about nine years from people noticing hearing loss to doing something about it. And this comes at a cost. It comes at a cost to the person who has the hearing loss as well as their family because their hearing loss remains un 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 unaddressed. So, for example, people continue to have difficulties with conversations, and this can eventually lead to re reduced social engagement and reduced well-being. And we also know about the, uh, the association between hearing loss, cognitive decline and dementia. But there's also a financial cost, and this is a cost to the individual in terms of them having to uh, purchase hearing health care, for example, hearing aids. And there's also a financial cost to the economy. So in 2020 in Australia, the cost of hearing loss to the Australian economy was $41 billion uh, per annum, of which around about $21 billion was due to reduced well-being. So in terms of hearing health and problems, there's lots of different problems, but some of the problems we're dealing with in this project um, are looking at recognising hearing difficulties. People often don't realise they've got a hearing loss, they blame it on other people or they think the television's not working so well or whatever. And um, there's often a poor understanding um, of impact of hearing loss and what to do about it. So people often don't realise that the downstream effects of hearing loss can lead to reduced um, isolation and well-being. There's often a, a lack of information or even worse, misinformation around hearing uh, care options and often inappropriate expectations. So many people will either think that hearing aids can completely cure hearing loss. On the other hand, there are people who remember their grandma from 20 years ago wearing a big old plastic um, piece of plastic in their ears, which didn't work, whistled and she didn't like it. So we're trying to address um, some of these problems with a solution called Hair Choice. This is based on research priorities that I mentioned um, earlier. And what we want to do is to provide advice and support so to help people make in, informed choices in their decision making for their hearing health. So I think it's really important to um, say that this research has been built on research priorities that have been identified by um, key stakeholders, including adults with hearing loss and audiologists. And I think it's really important to address the priorities of what um, the end users need, what adults with hearing loss need, rather than addressing what uh, researchers fancy doing in their research. So the research has been informed by a number of uh, publications. In 2019, the Roadmap from Hearing Health 
um, gave a recommendation, which was that people should have easy access to independent information on support and services. So they feel empowered to make safe and informed choices um, on their options. Um, a, a report in 2021 on the Hearing Services Programme, which is a publicly uh, funded hearing um, system in, in Australia, had a recommendation that there should be the development and application of decision aids. And then prior to that in the UK, um, the influential NICE guidelines on hearing loss that I was involved in developing um, had eight research uh, priorities. And one of those was what is the clinical and cost effectiveness of person-centered decision-making tools so people can um, use their preferred management strategy. Our solution um, to this is Hair Choice. Um, Hair Choice is a, pr a project that's been funded by the Australian government through the NHMRC um, funds. And what we're going to do is develop an online individualized decision support intervention. So we're developing a web-based app. And this is underpinned by theory, co-design and research. So the overall aim of Hair Choice is to develop and evaluate Hair Choice to increase an individual's ability to make informed decisions about their hearing health and to increase accessibility um, to uh, solutions and, and, and hearing health and to have an increase in uptake of hearing health care. So we can see down here we've got help seeking leading to informed choice, leading to decision making. And this is what um, Hair Choice is focusing on. Ultimately, we want to see an um, in increase in hearing health uptake across Australia. But the key um, focus or the key actions that Hear Choice um, makes is that we want to encourage people to take action for their hearing difficulties once they have used and worked through the Hear Choice program. And by doing this, uh, we want people to be empowered uh, to make and have choice and control over their hearing health. So Co-creation is really key in the development of Hear Choice. We're taking a community-based participatory approach involving many different people across the, um, the hearing um, and audiology landscape in Australia. We're involving people, particularly adult hearing um, adults with hearing um, loss in the co-design of Hair Choice. And we're using design principles. So we're taking an iterative approach to um, develop Hair Choice so we can build on um, the feedback we've had um, from our um, participants. We've also got um, some um, theory underpinning the development of Hair Choice. Uh, we want to meet all the um, um, international personal decision aid standards. Um, we're building our research on behavior change and that's, going, that's guided by the COMB uh, model. Um, one of the things, as I've already said, I think it's really important to get our research out there and to think about how we might implement Hair Choice should the findings uh, be very positive. So we're building implementation um, throughout the uh, research. User engagement is important. We want to develop something that people really enjoy using and are willing to use. And we want to make people uh, empowered. So some work we've done on hearing related empowerment involves all of these five dimensions, and we're addressing all of those in the design of Hair Choice. So in terms of the uh, research team, we've got many different um, stakeholders involved. And you can see that on the slide here. So on the left hand side, we've got um, the academics, the kind of researchers which are normally involved in research, which is great. I'm really, really happy to have the involvement from um, our academic uh, colleagues. But I think what makes this research really interesting is the input from um, advocacy groups. Um, so we've got input from a couple of the advocates groups in, in Australia, Soundfair and Better Hearing Australia input from a project specific community advisory group and we've also got a, a, a CCI panel to address the no research about us without us agenda and we've also got input from audiology from a number of different um, hearing healthcare providers um, but also from the uh, peak uh, professional body Audi audiology australia again with a view to getting our research out there when we've completed it so the study design is shown here. There are four work packages and the stakeholders and vo um, voice is embedded throughout. So the first um, work package is a needs analysis. So we, we conduct, we've conducted workshops, interviews, focus groups and online surveys. And I'll say more about the results in a minute. Um, we're currently developing um, here choice and we're doing this with um, workshops and initiative co-design that I mentioned previously. We'll evaluate um, Hair Choice using a randomized control trial um, and uh, health economic evaluation. 
And what we also want to understand is how people make decisions. The early part of the hearing healthcare journey where people are making decisions about what to do about the hearing health is really poorly understood. So we're going to have every click documented and we'll use machine learning to try and understand what approaches people take and to develop different types of profiles of, of the users. And then finally, as I've also alluded to, implementation is important. So what we want to do is to run workshops to co-develop an implementation plan to see how we can get it across Australia uh, once we've completed the, re the research. And we're currently at this, um, this point um, at the moment. So the first thing we did was to carry out um, a stakeholder workshop to ensure that the research was relevant to make sure that we're addressing all the key issues. Um, we did this um, by involving a whole group um, over, over um, 19 people across a whole group of different um, areas, um, areas in audiology across um, audiology in Australia. So we've involved uh, professional bodies, we've involved, we involved um, adults with hearing loss and advocacy groups, clinical audiologists and service providers. And we also had input into this a workshop from the uh, Department of Health. So we had people who were responsible for delivering hearing health um, at this very early part of our research. We developed a target statement, which sort of says what we aim to do. But, and we've got a load of data that we're still analysing from this. But I think the key thing that we got from this, um, this one day workshop that we held was we've got stakeholder buy-in. And many people shown on the slide here have been involved with the project uh, beyond that initial workshop and will be involved um, over the next year as we do the research. So um, we want to understand the hearing, early part of the hearing journey. And why is this important? Well, it's a very under-researched part of the um, hearing journey. So a systematic review in 2023 showed that over, um, with more than 30 studies, only four of those looked at help seeking. Um, another systematic review showed, looking at um, readiness and decision-making, had on only 23 um, studies. But actually, when you look at decision aids that have been developed um, through research um, in the literature, there are very few. So Louise Hickson um, developed a, a, and her team developed a prototype web-based decision aid. Um, and this was published in a paper last year. But the uh, prototype is still sitting on papers yet to be developed into something for use. And we know that other people um, have been using option grids, um, such as that shown here. So these have been used in the UK. I would also want to again say that uh, Barbara Timmer and Piers Dawes are also uh, working on the Hair Choice project. So in terms of understanding the early, early part of the hearing journey, we want to understand what the barriers and enablers to help seeking an informed decision making are. We also wanted to look at what features would be important to include in Hair Choice. And to do this, we conducted semi-structured interviews and focus groups with adults with hearing loss and hearing health care professionals. And to give you an idea of the kind of issues that people have, we've got a quote from one of our participants here. She said she was a lady in her 50s, her late 50s, who'd been having difficulties for a few years. She said, I feel a little bit clueless about going forward. And I think that that's a barrier that a lot of people feel in my position because you don't have that information. You just, you just feel a bit defeated. And then she went on to say, I just want basic information about what it might cost me, what I might be able to get from the government, what I might be able to do, those kind of things. So our um, early part of the um, study looking at focus groups and interviews was based on the Convier model, Convier model looking at help seeking and informed decision making as the target behaviors and looking at capability, motivation, and opportunity. And we've got lots of data from this, and I'm going to just show a summary here. So along the top, we've got factors that influence help seeking informed decision making, some of the features of hair choice that might, um, might help towards that, and what we think the outcome will be. So in terms of capability, knowledge is a key factor. And uh, key uh, points that came across were signs and symptoms of hearing loss, having re realistic expectations of hearing health care, understanding what the benefits are. And an important thing was around costs and funding. And this came through quite strongly um, at a number of different points of the research. In terms of features of hair choice, we can we see hair choice as being a, a trusted go to for clear and accessible information and advice. And the outcome would be improved knowledge. In terms of opportunity, whilst um, Hair choice can't directly address the factor shown here, which is that the audiology 
the audiologist offers clear explanation and addresses individual needs. Um, however, we can indirectly um, um, address this by empowering users to self-advocate and help them to influence the quality of their hearing health care. And then finally, in terms of motivation, the feeling of trust came through very, very strongly and was very important. So what we want to do is to provide unbiased information about hearing care and um, um, hearing, hearing care professionals to increase trust and self-efficacy. We identified tons of different features um, from our stakeholders, and they fall in these key themes here around credibility, content, information, um, rehab, how to find and look and feel. And you can see that cost and funding again were very important, up at 83%. And the role of um, hearing care professionals is really key to this in terms of providing credibility for hair choice and also helping people to find hair choice in the first place. So in terms of our online um, surveys, um, we did a survey of 300 adults with hearing loss and hearing care, uh, 50 hearing care professionals. And some of the findings on the views of hearing choice are shown here. So about three quarters of adults with hearing loss said they would be interested in using hair choice to help make decisions. Uh, we asked a few more questions of the um, hearing care providers. 85% um, said they thought hair choice would be a useful tool. 82% um, said they thought hair choice would support shared decision making with audiologists. 74% said they were glad a, a client had used hair choice for an important uh, an appointment. And 68% said they would recommend hair choice to clients. So we we're really happy about this because we were only able to get a little bit of a flavour of what hair choice was and people were very supportive of it. I've got some data here now to show what kind of options uh, are offered to the participants in our surveys. And so across the top, you can see um, the percentage there. And not surprisingly, uh, just under 60% of people um, were offered hearing aids. But if you look at the other options, such as hearables, ALDs, communication training, or auditor training, the uh, only between about 5 and 15% of people were offered those. But even more importantly, were the missed opportunities. So this slide shows the percentage of participants who are interested in, in, a, in an intervention, but who are not offered it. So there were still some people who were still interested in the hearing aids, but you can see between 60 and 90% of people were interested in all those other options, but were not offered it. So what we want to do in Hair Choice is address those missed opportunities. Okay. So this is what Hair Choice looks like. Um, we've got the we've got two sec main sections. Section A is really helping people to um, understand more about their hearing loss. We're going to provide some online links. Uh, to hearing tests and we want to um, explain to people and, and uh, uh, explain to people about the impacts of hearing loss and what the benefits of hearing health um, hearing health care are. So, to, so what we're trying to do with this first part is to help prime people to really get into I must do something about my hearing loss. Um, we've got a, um, an eligibility quiz so those who are eligible for the hearing service program can, will know whether they are or not. And then finally, we've got the, the, the second part, which is um, the decision making part, where we provide a full range of hearing health um, options. And we build in um, key parts of decision making. So we offer, um, we make it very clear about what choices are available. We explain what those um, choices are, and we offer the pros and cons of each option. Throughout the development of, of the of Hair Choice, we've had a, a number of uh, consumer co-design workshops and they've been absolutely fantastic. We've lot, had lots of different perspectives and views of how we should, what kind of wording we should use. Only this week we did a, we had a, a workshop on how the decision making flow would go, and so that was super helpful. And um, in terms of wording, um, we've had we've had help with that. People saying this is what it means to us. And then we've set the readability to that of around 13, 14 year olds. So we try to make it as clear as possible. We've um, tested a minimal vi viable product using Think Aloud cognitive interviews. And um, so we had a PowerPoint presentation on our laptop. We also had a bunch of um, Word documents that people could look at. And what was really interesting was as they worked through the option was this realization that there's more on offer than hearing aids and what those are. So this idea of sowing the seeds around what was available became through, came through really strongly. So we, we are going to actively encourage people to reconsider their choices as they move through the program. People um, really liked the pros of the hearing, um, the hearing aids, but what they liked even more were the cons. 
they felt that uh, bias um, showing not just the pros but also the cons was um, leading to um, a, an application that was very trustworthy. Um, our participants said they thought uh, here choice was very easy to understand, there was the right amount of information, and they were able to easily separate out what the different options were. And as part of this, they, they talked about their own experiences. And I just want to share with you an email that Pip, uh, one of our CCI people, sent after she'd taken part, that's her showing there, after she'd taken part in the um, cognitive interview. She goes, gosh, here choice progress looks really, really good. As a consumer needing to make assistance choices, the tool felt like I had, like I had a personal coach assisting me to navigate the website, or, albeit in a printed form. Moreover, it breathed non-judgmental, no hard sell, no pontificating, no bias, with simple empathic language. So it's for, us, for me as a researcher, it's really encouraging to get this kind of feedback. And I think this is because we involve CCI right through this project. So this is what here choice is going to be looking like. We've got different um, levels of information. So when we introduce, when we have the introductory level, we're making all options available. So most people know about do nothing on the left and hearing aids on the right. And what we want to do is to introduce all the other types of um, interventions for, for that can be used as part of hearing healthcare. So learning to listen, well-being, and other different types of um, hearing technology. We then um, provide what we call basic information. So at this point, we'll introduce sort of different um, different aspects. So for example, um, talk about the different types of technologies that are available or different type of non-technologies um, that are available. And uh, this is what the um, app um, is starting to look like. This is the contents page um, for the decisions. So we've got all six options there from do nothing to hearing aids split up between non-technology options and technology options with a little bit mentioned for each uh, of those options and people can click on them we want them to look at all the options and they get um, an introduction that you can see here, see here at the very top which is just a, a brief introduction to in this case making the most of your communication and then we provide a bit more information about what this means so for example better communication with others so we're looking at communication training or training your brain to listen better. So we talk about um, what auditory training is. Similarly, for the technology options, at, at the basic level, you might just be able to go and see here, we also include the price range, which was really important, and where people go to get this, um, to get these technologies. We then go on to the, the, the most detailed uh, part of um, the information, which is looking at what's involved and pros and cons. But by the time people get down to this point, They've already decided what it is they're interested in, what they want to know more about. We'll then provide all their options that they've chosen, as you can see on the left. And then, um, you know, people can sort of add more, they can take those away. And then we're going to have a compare choices, a bit like when you're comparing your credit card options. So we're still working on this, but you can see we've got things like, you know, availability where people could go to get help, what the cost is, and whether there's any financial support from the hearing services programme. We then move on to um, the final bit, which is where we ask people to make their decision. And they can choose as many options as they like. They don't just need to choose one. But what we'd like them to say is whether they've decided they're going to take action for their hearing difficulties or not. Um, and then if they uh, do take action, what their plan is. We want them to make an action plan. This has been shown to be a behavior change technique. We ask them, what will they do? And we'll provide a drop down box of what the options are for whichever option they're interested in or options they're interested in. And when will they do it? So we want to make this time, time critical. You know, we want people to do this, you know, within a few weeks or a few months at least of, of using hair choice. And then we're going to ask them to commit to their plan. So that's where we're at with the research at the moment. In summary, I hope you can see that um, um, involving key stakeholders throughout provides unique and novel um, input that you wouldn't get if you didn't. From the Hear Choice study, and um, that's exactly what we've done, we've identified barriers of facilitators to help seeking informed decision making. We've identified what adults with hearing loss want from Hear Choice, and it's really clear that hearing aids alone are not the only option. We've co-designed co the Hair Choice spec and has taken an initiative participatory approach. And we have this um, concept called sowing the seeds where people, when they start using Hair Choice, realize what's available to them and they start seeing what it is that they really want. 
We're seeing that here, Choice has high levels of support from stakeholders. And in conclusion, and I think it's not just about here, Choice, I see, here, see to here, but other um, areas of research um, that stakeholder involvement, participatory approaches are now a must have, not a nice to have. Um, so I'd like to finally finishing off by thanking um, the many people who have been involved in the research, our research team, in particular, Alan Bothy, who's played a massive role in the uh, project to date, um, our consumer group and everybody else who's, who's been involved. Um, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A session that follows on from this uh, recorded presentation. And I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you very much.